Good afternoon. We'd like to thank you for joining us today for our webinar of eyes and Parkinson's disease with Dr. Scott Stevens of Bend Ophthalmology in Bend, Oregon. My name is Carol File and I am the program coordinator for Parkinson's Resources of Oregon in Central Oregon. Parkinson's Resources of Oregon serves all of Oregon and Southwest Washington with opportunities like these educational webinars a few times a year, as well as conferences, education and wellness programs, helpline, support groups, and social worker services. We have three offices located in Beaverton, Eugene, and Bend. If you don't live in those areas with access to our live programs, we are still available to you via email or phone. Before I introduce Dr. Stevens, I'd like to go over some tips for the best webinar viewing. The control panel to the right of your screen, you should be able to see. Under audio, click the audio button on the screen and choose either listen through your computer or by phone. Click one of the circles. If you choose phone, you will need to call that number and follow the prompted directions with a pin and access code. Make sure your volume is turned on on your computer and correctly set, set it on your computer or phone. Uh, headsets are recommended for best audio. All attendees are muted and only the presenter and moderator have audio. On the question box, if you're having problems with your audio, let us know through the question box and we'll try to help. The first priority today on questions will be ans answered are from the Eventbrite registration where you signed up. If you have additional questions, you're free to type them into the question box and we'll try to answer them during the webinar, but if we run out of time, we will get back to you afterwards. Exit if you need to quit by clicking the X on the upper right side of the control panel. When you receive a survey after the webinar, please give us your honest feedback. This webinar will be recorded and you can access it on youtube.com, then search Parkinson's Research Resources of Oregon. mouse problems momentarily. <laughs> okay, let's try this. Center podcast. Let's interchange. Sheesh. Sorry. <laughs> My mouse is is functioning. Come on. All the things. Come on. Thank you. I want to especially thank Carol for working so hard to make this presentation possible. Today, uh, a little bit about myself. I'm Dr. Scott Stevens, and I've been in Bend now for a little over 20 years. I came here from the University of South Florida, where I attained the rank of an associate professor, then left academics, and have since been practicing in a private clinical setting here in Bend since. Carol approached me uh, oh, about four or six months ago with regards to talking about Parkinson's disease in the eye. They did a presentation that some of you may have attended down at the public library, and then now I've been asked to do a webinar, and I'm really quite honored and pleased to do so. I'm going to go through Parkinson's disease primarily. There are some other associated neurodegenerative disorders that fall within this category, such as oh, uh, uh, supernuclear palsies, or excuse me, I'm sorry, but um, progressive supernuclear palsies. I'll discuss, I would appreciate talking to those people probably directly 
is that's a, a small variant. Some of these symptoms will be present within that disease process, but it's a little bit more specific than what the audience we're trying to target today. So if you get your information to Carol, then I would be happy to discuss with you on a personal level your questions as far as that goes, if, if you so desire. With regards to Parkinson's disease, uh, I, the reason I moved to Central Oregon was one, uh, I really enjoy living in Central Oregon and allows me to pursue passions such as um, hunting and fishing and then being able to do uh, a good job of being able to take care of my patients with a personal touch compared to being in Tampa, Florida with, in St. Petersburg, Florida with three million other lives. It can be a bit overwhelming at times. With regards to Parkinson's disease, it's the most common neurodegenerative disorder that you're dealing with. There's a million people in the United States that have this disease. One percent of the entire population over 60 may actually have it. The average onset is 57. Believe it or not, I have several patients that had their onset of Parkinson's uh, before the age of 50, uh, which can be a problem for that particular patient group. I'm gonna move this over to the other side uh, so I can see things better, and you can see things better because you're seeing my screen. There's visual symptoms and signs of Parkinson's, and a lot of them are eye movement disorders and difficulties that are listed, uh, one being accommodative paralysis or paresis, convergence insufficiency extraordinarily competent, a common impaired smooth pursuits, prolonged saccade latency, hypometric saccades, and visual spatial dysfunction. And these are all Greek to you, but these are actually the terms we use in order to help the patient identify what's going on. I'm going to go through each of these so that we have a better understanding of, what's, of, of how we define them and what symptoms that you might be experiencing as a patient. Understand that when you have impaired, let me back up, accommodative paralysis or convergence insufficiency is where when you go to look at something, you actually have to do some complex things. And I have uh, two eyes that I'm going to try and demonstrate that for you so that you can see it a little bit better. Uh, but these are two model eyes. And when you're looking at something, you actually have to look down, then you have to turn in, and then you have to track. Each of the extract of the muscles have to coordinate together in order to make that happen. At the same time, you have to change the shape of your pupil to then fixate at what you're looking at. With Parkinson's disease, each one of those maneuvers can become increasingly more difficult, thus making it very hard to read. And so patients often complain about with Parkinson's that they can't read for any extended period of time. And that extended period of time can be on the order of a minute to within five minutes and definitely often within 15 minutes. We can treat that. The treatment is actually to try and have the patients use a single vision glass for reading. We get rid of bifocals. Uh, there's another reason I'll explain and a reason why we get rid of bifocals as well. And then you also have to take the bifocal and you may need prism. Prism is simply where we're going to bend light by changing how we build that lens so that the image that you're looking at lands on the right spot in the back of your eye so that you don't have any double. One of the other things that a patient can always do is just read with one eye. And so simply you can put a tissue behind your glass. Some patients actually go as far to wear an iPad in order to block the reading. That helps solve it. Saccades, that's on the bottom of this slide, is just the rapid movement of your eyes. So that's where your eyes have to move very fast to go pick up the target. With impaired smooth pursuits, which is a common problem for Parkinson's disease, the patient has difficulty maintaining fixation on a slow moving target. So if someone is walking across the patio, you have a hard time actually tracking that person. That's not unusual. You can have a slowed response to when you move your eyes to a new target. So if all of a sudden there is a cat that's walking across the same patio, you realize there's a cat, but you can't move your eyes fast enough to pick up that new target. That's also a symptom of Parkinson's. When you act, hypometric saccades is that when you go move and you like all of a sudden have to go look at the cat. Once you can't move very fast too, you'll actually stop before you get to the cat. And that's a hypometric saccade. That's not unusual as well. Patients, when they're reading, all these things are happening. Saccades, when you go from the end of one line of a target and then move to the other one, is a very fast movement. You might undershoot to get to the next line. You could possibly overshoot. You may not find it. So that's why reading gets very difficult for my patients with Parkinson's, is the saccadic movement that they're dealing with can be a problem. Hang on, my device has decided to have a life of its own. 
visual spatial dysfunctions where you can't really think and orient it in three dimensions. So everybody goes, huh, it might look like a flat picture is the best way I could try to describe that. And you might make it because you're part of this flat picture, you can't tell depth very well. Knowing that you can't tell depth very well, then you're actually going to um, have that problem for yourself. Um, let me shrink this out of the way. Maybe not. There we go. Impaired antisacot is a term that was described when you're moving your eyes back to a target that you thought you saw. If we go back to that story about that cat that walked across the patio and you remember there being a cat, you're going to go search to find it. That can really be quite difficult for the patients with Parkinson's as well. Knowing that there's visual movement disorders with how you move your eyes, and then Parkinson's patients oftentimes have difficulties with wondering uh, that they can actually fall. I saw a gentleman this week that with his Parkinson's actually fell straight on his face, and the entire right side of his face was all swollen. I couldn't even examine his eye. He has Parkinson's, and it's actually a very, very, uh, uh, we have to see him back later this week just so we can make sure that his eye is completely normal. Uh, look pretty good, but the amount of swelling you can have from just simply falling because of balance issues is important for the Parkinson's patients to try and fight. Well, the best way to do that is as much as you're resistant to using a cane or a walker to keep yourself mobile and maintaining good body posture, it's really quite necessary. Uh, my dad had a cane and one of my favorite stories is people were crowding him and I believe it was in Safeway and his cane became the most ample weapon because he could just lift it up and just point it and people would give him more space. He thought that was quite empowering as he had balance issues from a stroke. We don't recommend bifocals with patients who have difficulty moving as the bifocal itself sits in the bottom part of your glasses. So it sits way down here. Well, when you put your glasses on, you then end up having that get in the way of your field of vision as you're moving and you already have balance disorders. So we recommend that patients not wear glasses with bifocals and just stick with distance glasses. And oftentimes those distance glasses need to have a prism in them so that the patient can maintain one object. That's really important long-term for the uh, patients and what we're trying to do for them. Yeah, I'm going to the next slide. We now have the most common concerns happening with patients and it's related to Parkinson's as well. And these are dry eye symptoms and they're due to uh, numerous things. One is, is always realize that the patients with Parkinson's can win a staring contest. It's actually quite impressive. They can win just about all of them uh, because they don't blink. The average blink rate is 12 to 18 times a minute. Patients with Parkinson's might blink four to six times a minute. That's uh, hard on the eye. When it doesn't blink, there's not an exchange of tear film. It can trigger blepharospasm. Blepharospasm is where the eyelids will just come down and they won't open up. And it's painful for the patient sometimes. So they have uncontrolled eyelid closing and they learn to keep their eyes wet if they can. They then have difficulty opening their eyes. That's called a praxy of eyelid opening. That was one of the questions that one of the uh, people sent in saying that, hey, I have difficulty keeping my eyes open or opening on its own. True statement, it's a praxy of eyelid opening. It's not uncommon with Parkinson's. Interestingly enough, the opposite phenomenon, the blepharospasm, actually can prevent patients from putting eye drops in. So my patients with Parkinson's, when they go put a drop in and they go try to do that, they actually can have a tremor that makes it very dangerous to do drops, so they get a bath and it goes all over their face and they waste a lot of money on eye drops. That's important to know that don't use drops. If you also are the person where when you have blepharospasm, so when something gets closed to your eye, you shut them so tight, nothing gets in, that's a common phenomenon with Parkinson's, then eye drops are not a good choice for you as well. When you don't blink as well and you have lid spasm, then lid inflammation just makes sense. And patients can have blepharospasm when they're dealing with, when they're dealing with Parkinson's mainly related to the dry eye, which is what keratoconjunctivitis sicca, that really long word at the bottom, is. It's just dry eye. When you're treating dry eye and you have Parkinson's and you have a tremor, sometimes it works a little bit better if you use ointment. An artificial tear ointment just goes on the end of your finger a little bit, so it's not that much, and it goes right on the inside of your lid right before you go to bed or when you feel like your eyes are dry. It'll stick around. And now the vision in my right eye is pretty blurry, um, but it actually solves the dry eye problem, which is why you do it. it might, if you use too much of the ointment, it's actually going to grease your lids and people will start staring at you more than you want. So I recommend a little bit goes a long ways. This tube of ointment 
will readily last three to four months. Um, so I've gone over all of this for you so that you have it. There's a lot of questions that came in. When we deal with visual symptoms and signs, you can have this really weird impaired color discrimination. So colors seem a little bit muted. If you're already a male and you have red, green, colorblind symptoms, you may also note it as well. And it might be a little bit more than what you're used to in the past. You can have decreased contrast sensitivity. That's where if it's low light, you're not seen as well. That's actually common. Keep in mind that Parkinson's disease is a separate phenomenon, can affect how you use your eyes and vision but you're still prone as you age to get cataracts. And one of the symptoms of cataract surgery is color discrimination issues and contrast sensitivity. So sometimes it's hard to set that, separate that out. Also realize that when you have Parkinson's disease, you're still prone for macular degeneration, which is common as we get older. You're still prone for glaucoma, which is also more common as we get older. So those diseases we look at separate from Parkinson's disease, uh, just so that you know that from the ophthalmology standpoint. The final one is visual hallucinations. And visual hallucinations, we thought were really quite rare, but believe it or not, up to 40% of patients who are on medication for their Parkinson's actually still have visual hallucinations, which is a bit bothersome for the patients. It means seeing things that maybe really aren't there. And that makes it a bit um, difficult for patients and they don't really like that, in, in my opinion, from patients that I take care of. At this time, I'm going to answer some of the questions that you all sent in for me. So I move over to my cheat sheet. One of the things I'd like to recommend for people is that this is an L-shaped ruler. This is great if you're having difficulty reading. The vertical line actually goes to the left of where you're trying to read. So you know where to go as your eyes are undershooting or overshooting. You'll see that space. The horizontal line goes right below the line that you're reading so that you can track it. Sometimes holding this and then using your finger is a very beneficial way to continue to read. As your Parkinson's gets worse, it's not unusual for the reading to actually get a little bit worse. There were several questions with like, what kind of eye drops should I use? I believe I've answered that with the thicker the eye drop, the better. Several of my patients don't have a tremor. So using a thicker gel-based drop is a more beneficial for them. It initially blurs vision, but it disappears in about three to five minutes, and then they can accomplish near point activities better and more easily for themselves. With regards to the more severe dry eye, because if you don't blink, you're really going to dry out, get lid inflammation, then the ointment preparations or the gel that comes in a tube are better preparations. As much as I can, as I've looked on the marketplace, the only one that's a predictable, there's one called Gentile Gel, it comes in a tube, and then Sustain Gel, it comes in a tube. I find those sometimes the favorite items that my patients will use when they're having a bad day, because your dry eye sensations are gonna wax and wane. Some days are gonna be better than others. If you're trying to accomplish a lot of near point activities, well, you have to slow down your blink rate, and when you have Parkinson's, you're already doing that, but it makes it a lot harder to then read because you're drying out. Well, using the gel-based stuff will help accomplish the help restore your tear film so you can accomplish those near point activities better and more efficiently so you don't get so frustrated. Because I deal with a lot of patients who are extraordinarily frustrated by the difficulty that they have accomplishing near point activities because their eyes truly are dry now. When it comes to glaucoma, you're on agents to treat your Parkinson's. In glaucoma, we primarily treat with eye drops. So if you can't, if you have a tremor and you can't do eye drops, well, that's going to make either you dependent on a family member to help you with getting your glaucoma medications, or you're going to be looking at having a uh, surgery to uh, lower the pressure in your eye because we feel the pressure is too high and it's causing damage to your optic nerve, thus putting your uh, vision at risk for down the road. So it makes it the Parkinson's patients, if they have a tremor, it's important for their eye care professional to know that because we'll just prescribe drops, not realizing that you really can't put them in. And so it's important to make sure that you let your eye care professional know if you have a tremor that's actually going to get in the way of you being able to take the medications like we need you to in order to control the pressure in your eye. When it comes to cataract surgery, all of us as we're aging are going to be inclined to get a cataract. 
Cataract surgery is the most commonly surgically performed, most common surgery performed in this country. Knowing that, the uh, patients will ask, will my Parkinson's interfere with cataract surgery? Typically, we accomplish cataract surgery under local or topical anesthesia with a tiny bit of intravenous sedation and sometimes none at all. So we don't think that you're having Parkinson's would interfere with your outcomes with cataract surgery. As you age, just about all of us, as we all age, we all develop cataracts. We don't think that cataract surgery in the patients with Parkinson's has increased risk of a bad outcome for themselves. Uh, if you have a head tremor associated with your Parkinson's, then we would need to do what we could to control the head tremor. Uh, and that would be important because we can't have you moving while we're while you're doing the surgery. So if that's present, then it might change a little bit about how we go ahead and do the surgery. But as far as outcomes go, we've not been able to delineate a poor outcome in patients who have Parkinson's disease. There was a there was a question about macular degeneration. And understand that we use this phrase that 90% of 90-year-olds have some form of macular degeneration. It can be a very mild to dry form that doesn't really have a dramatic effect on vision. If the dry form converts to the wet form of the disease, then central vision can be drastically affected. And these are uh, patients you may be aware of that are getting injections anywhere between once every four, six, or eight weeks in order to keep their eye from developing new blood vessels and having difficulties with vision. And we try to stabilize those patients. Knowing that, Macular degeneration doesn't have an association with Parkinson's disease. It's mainly related to uh, aging. We do know that patients who smoke are at greater risk for macular degeneration. We also know there's a genetic predisposition in families where macular degeneration is definitely a bit more common. There are studies that have uh, proven now that if we on a higher dose of vitamins and we eat a good diet that's heavy in vegetables, uh, we may actually be able to delay the onset of macular degeneration and prevent the worst form of it. But those studies are still ongoing, but we have pretty good evidence that that's not going to harm the patient and definitely may benefit them. So we encourage that sort of a diet for our patients who are showing signs of macular degeneration. There was another question that a patient had stated that Parkinson's has had a huge effect, huge impact on my acuity and comprehension. And they have, uh, they've had an accident and then had, they lost the vision in the right eye and then have sympathetic ophthalmia in the left eye. Sympathetic ophthalmia is simply a autoimmune response where trauma in the first eye woke up the immune system then to attack the remaining, the remaining eye. The trauma on the, the eye with the original trauma may end up being the better seen eye. We now use a fairly aggressive armamentarium of immunomodulating drugs in order to deal with sympathetic ophthalmia. So the patients could do quite well. The interaction of those medications to their Parkinson's medications and their Parkinson's disease, they could interact. And so that's something where your ophthalmologist would need to be communicating with your physician who's prescribing the uh, Parkinson's medicines so that they're on the same page so that you do as well as you can. Most, one person asked, is deterioration of my vision an inedible symptom of Parkinson's disease? We actually don't think so. We think that you're gonna have problems with dry eye, it's treatable. We think you're gonna have cataract sur surgery down the road. Well, that's gonna result in good vision. If you get macular degeneration, we definitely want you eating a diet with a lot of leafy green vegetables. If you wanted to be on the AREDS2 vitamin supplement, you can. And then just a close observation to making sure that you're not showing signs of converting from the dry form of the disease to the wet form of the disease. But those are normal aging processes that affect our vision. Glaucoma is as well. There isn't a stronger association of those diseases with Parkinson's. We do have patients who uh, suffer from dry eye. The dry eye patient with Parkinson's, they actually um, spend a lot more time trying to figure out what's the best method, best method for them. I have a couple of patients for which we prescribe autogelous serum drops. Those patients um, do well with using the serum. Understand that serum is the stuff that your red blood cells, your white blood cells, and your platelets swim around in to get from point A to point B. We spin the blood down, take the serum off, and then we make drops with the serum mixed with a balanced salt solution. Those can be frozen, and the patients can use those drops as often as they need to because there's not a preservative in the drops. That can help restore the tear film to where even though they have a decreased blink rate, 
they may be more comfortable. And that's actually something that I've done for a couple of my patients for which nothing else has seemed to work. That's not available as a gel or an ointment. So that patient really can't have a tremor in order to use those drops. And that's important for the patient to understand. One patient asked, can vision changes happen quickly with Parkinson's disease? Uh, not necessarily. If the dry eye, it, it's kind of going to be based on how fast the Parkinson's disease is progressing. Some patients, their disease is, uh, relap is, is unremitting, and they go from being fine one moment and then, and then not so fine uh, six months to a year later. That patient's probably going to have a little bit more, more rapid uh, symptoms of dry eye and other concerns, especially with regards to reading. Typically, the symptoms are pretty insidious and subtle to start off with, so we can catch those and stage the treatment for the patients um, over time. None of my patients with Parkinson's have actually um, succumbed to their disease uh, rapidly, in, in my opinion. I have a fair number that I've taken care of for a number of years, and it's a slowly progressive disease process, which I'm very grateful for, so it allows the patient time to acclimate and accommodate the changes that are actually happening. Um, which is always important as we age, especially with the long-term disease process. Does anyone have any additional questions? Dr. Stevens, we have... <laughs> Little feedback. <laughs> we have some questions that have come in. Uh, let's see here uh, about glaucoma. Let's see. Sorry here. Let me find this one. Okay, here's one. My dad has a drooping eyelid kind of condition. He's not able to read and watch watches very uh, not very much TV. He was told this is not curable for a Parkinson's patient. Okay, hang on, my mind back up. Yeah. There we go, I'm turning my volume up so that you can hear me. So the question is, is that... Turn my volume back up. Sorry. Sorry. With regards to the question, so my dad has a pilot, I'm having a difficult time both reading and then watching TV, and that nothing can be done from that. A couple of things come to mind that may help. One is, is that your dad is able to read, because some of my Parkinson's patients kind of have lost the desire to read. So if that's in place and intact, that's wonderful. Go to large print items. That's why we love the nooks and the iPads because that e-format to be able to read will make the image a lot easier for the patient to see, possibly without a bifocal. That's kind of an important piece. Uh, that way they can actually track and read and accomplish and, and, and read for enjoyment. And that will actually then, if you make the print large enough, make it so that there isn't a big transition between near and distance for the patient. If the patient doesn't need any distance correction, and sometimes the a Nook or the iPad is going to require a low power reading glass that the patient can wear in order to accomplish the reading at near. And then making sure that the eye is wet when you read is somewhat important as well. Because once you start to dry out, you can't get a good image and it makes it very difficult to read. That, that's important for each of us to understand. TV is always generally a distance related phenomenon. And so making sure that you can see the TV with your best correction possible. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes we have to put prism in that glass in order to keep the eyes together. If the lid is too droopy or there's no lid tone, it becomes very difficult to do surgery on that patient because they've lost their ability to blink. That would be a bit unusual, but can occur. Well, then looking down is going to be much easier than looking at the TV straight across the room because your lid has to, when you're looking up, you got to bring your lid all the way up. And then looking down, you can keep your lids at half rest. Parkinson's uh, with the apraxia of the lid eyelid opening, it sometimes is very difficult for the patients to get their eyes wide open in order to accomplish tasks and their resting spot is a little bit lower. So looking down to accomplish things could work. Well, then just convert your iPad 
to your TV, connect them if you have that ability within your house, because smart TVs allow you to do that. And patients can watch their TV on their computer screen, like I'm on the computer screen right now, and that can sit lower. And then that's closer as well, so that can help the patient actually see TV, especially now with all of the Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime applications that are out there, so that they can be connected to the real world, which is important. Any other questions? Okay, here's another one. Please discuss alpha synuclein tears, the significance, and how is it measured and who does this? I'm going to repeat the question. Please discuss alpha synuclein tears significance. How is it measured and who does this? Oops. I think the, the, the question is referring to how do we actually measure to, uh, tear levels and then do we know osmolality of tears? Tear osmolality is you would come into the office and a little capillary tube would uh, uh, draw up the tears and then we can set it into the osmolarity machine and know what the tear osmolality is. That actually, if it's above 308, would indicate that the patient's osmolality is above normal indicating they're really quite dry. If the patient already has a reduced tear lake, has a, a rapid tear breakup time, and those are terms we use in ophthalmology, or has a fair amount of lid inflammation, we're, we can almost make the assumption that the tear osmolality will be, reduced, will be increased in the patient with dry eye. Then we know if your tear osmolality is up, then we know that you're not making enough tears, then supplemental tears makes a difference warm compresses to help with the oil gland oil release from the meibomian glands becomes critical for the patient as well so that we can make a better more unified tear layer uh, for the patient so that they can actually function throughout their day one of the other things that can be done is we can look for inf inflammatory modules matrix metallic protein levels in tear film and if that's elevated then we know that the patient's actually having a fair amount of low grade inflammation with their tear film those are office-based procedures that happen in ophthalmologist offices. You would have to call the ophthalmologist offices and ask, as they have to have lab certification in order to accomplish some of those tests. Um, and then that way we have, if we go treat you, especially with MMP levels, and that's a positive or negative test. If all of a sudden we're now measuring no MMP levels or too low, then we would know that the treatment's actually working and there's less inflammation in your tear film which would be causing irritation for you as well. Uh, autogalous serum drops haven't really been proven to reduce or eliminate that MMP level, despite the patient telling us that they feel wonderful. So we don't quite have the answer on how to best decrease matrimotrox protein levels outside of low dose or uh, outside of low dose topical steroids, which helps that a bit for patients and has been used in the past to treat the discomfort as well, as well as supplementing with artificial tears. Any other questions? Yes. A, an attendee would like to know how is double vision treated? Double vision is treated by using um, glasses as the most part. If someone has perfect distance vision, it's often my most frustrating patient because then I have to build a pair of glasses that have clear glass on the top and then have to lay prisms in them in order to then get the eyes to fuse together understand that when we do prism it's really meant for primary gaze so it's when you're looking straight ahead if you're then looking to the right or to the left you would then end up having double vision because your eyes might not move together because of the parkinson's so the patient then ends up moving their head because it's really not a good idea to have any double vision it can lead to instability of movement and mobility problems so the prism in the glasses can help that I have several patients who have prism in their glasses, and that's because they can't move their eyes in anymore to be able to read. So we put prism in the reading glasses to facilitate that form to make it much easier to read. And they just have two separate pairs of glasses. And oftentimes, the prism in the distance glasses doesn't even match the prism that's in the for the reading glasses. So they have really two distinct pairs of glasses that they use. Additional questions, please. Here's a question, uh, are progressive lens, lens glasses okay? 
Progressive glasses are simply where we build the bifocal within the glass and it doesn't have a line. It's a great invention. It allows patients to pretty much move their head up and down and get almost any distance into focus that they're trying to achieve. So progressive allow, glasses allow for good distance vision, intermediate, which would be computer or basically reading a recipe card or watching it, uh, watching the dashboard of your car. The, uh, and then it has near. And it's based on where you hold your head as you look through the bifocal segment that allows you your best vision. And patients get pretty good at adapting to that. However, again, with Parkinson's, if you're having a problem with mobility, we won't recommend that you actually have a progressive lens because it can really mess with your uh, distortion, visual distortion to where you see the bifocal, thus causing balance issues. And we really don't want our patients with Parkinson's falling. Falling is one of the most dangerous things that the patient can do. Additional questions? Here's a, here's a good question. One patient wrote in that, why are my eyes so red and dry after showering? It's a great question because they just stepped into a high humidity environment and they're stepping out and they're realizing their eyes are red. Well, a couple things. You could see, and I'm joking here, you could take a cold shower and see if it still happens because um, I have a sneaking suspicion it won't because uh, the heat within the shower is helping to contribute to the vasodilation on the front of the eye and so it'll appear a little bit more red. Always understand too that when you suffer from dry eye, your eyes are actually going to get more red with time. It has to do with the, the capillaries becoming a little, the blood vessels will get a bit more uh, thicker. So we, we don't have that white and bright eye look anymore that we had when we were in our 15 and 20 years of age. It gets a bit more ruddy complected and that's just simply because the front of the eye needs more food. It gets there by blood flow. In order for more blood flow, we have to increase the caliber of the blood vessels. So the blood vessels in the front of our eye increase in caliber over time, thus making our eyes appear more red. That's why we have products like Visine. It helps get the red out. The difficulty is, is the rebound redness might be more severe than the original uh, redness. And so uh, those of us in ophthalmology are not big fans of Visine as a rule to get the red out in all those products, simply because we think long term, it doesn't necessarily put the patient in a better place. We think that artificial teardrops and warm compresses and these kinds of things help the patient better to help establish better tear film and better hygiene for long term eye care. If you have a sudden change, there was one person that asked, over the past last over the last year, my vision in my right eye has deteriorated greatly. Is this related to the Parkinson's disease? Most likely not. There's something else going on. So because Parkinson's disease generally does not result in a sudden loss of vision in one eye. So and realize we look at Parkinson's disease as completely separate than glaucoma, macular degeneration, cataracts. So if you're having a change in one eye, we're going to go look to figure out why do you have a change happening in one eye, and we're unlikely to even be thinking that it's related to your Parkinson's disease. So if you if you have been told that that's the case, um, I would have you um, be re-examined to make sure that that's truly the case, because that would be that would be very unusual. I have another one here that says, I can't see well, even with my glasses and keeping my eyelids open for more than a few minutes is uncomfortable. Do this, I can't read or watch TV. Uh, that's not uncommon. You have a blink rate problem related to your Parkinson's and so you're drying out. So I would have you start using artificial tear ointment, not the gel in a tube, but the ointment at nighttime. I would definitely encourage you to do hot compresses. Hot compresses are not that hard to do. You can take a dry cotton sock, you can fill it up with seeds of your choice, tie off the sock, you microwave the sock and the seeds for a minute, it's going to get a little bit warm so be careful. You take a washcloth, wet the washcloth, wring the washcloth out, the washcloth goes on your eyes first and the sock full of seeds second. That actually will then provide warm moist heat to your lids. When you finish after about 15 minutes, take the washcloth, wrap it around your finger and gently massage your lash line. That will help massage the oil glands and get the debris off that's been collecting on the base of your lashes and your eyes should start to feel better. You'll still not be able to watch TV for as long as you want because you don't, you're going to dry out because your blink rate is markedly reduced. You could put an artificial teardrop in your eye and then watch TV and see how well you do. But I'm not surprised by that complaint. And it, it, Patients have a tendency to get books on tape and listen to TV if they actually can't watch TV. Uh, which is 
uh, not uncommon with this disease process. Any other questions? Oh, here's a nice one. What can I do to help my doctor identify the vision issues with Parkinson's disease? Well, this the Parkinson the, the, the organization that you've logged in today it has the ability to get you information so that you can present that to your ophthalmologist or even your optometric physician so that they become um, more more uh, informed as to Parkinson's disease. But keep in mind that Parkinson's disease, and other eye, common eye diseases are not really related. The most common things that the patient complains about are things that I've already addressed, and it has to do with difficulty reading. My optometric physician colleagues, as well as my um, ophthalmology colleagues here in Bend, are all very good at actually isolating those problems and getting the patients in glasses that actually work for them, as that's the number one thing we, are, we will do. They're all very good at identifying who's very dry, to then solve the dry eye problems because they come hand in hand with our patients with Parkinson's disease. Also knowing that the drugs you have to take to treat Parkinson's also help contribute to dry eye state as well. So you need to be, the best patients I have are the ones that hand me an entire sheaf of information. They say, hey, Dr. Stevens, is there anything in here that I could really benefit from? And I read it and I look and see based on them and where they're at, what would be the best thing for them to at least try so that they have better functional days. You're still going to have days, though, in which the dry eye is going to win because you don't blink as much if your disease is pretty advanced, and it makes it hard to accomplish tasks. You can get a humidifier. I've had a couple of patients do this trick where they get the baby humidifiers, and they put it like in their living room. They don't have it glowing on them, and they increase the humidity within their living room in the room that they're most commonly in in order to create a little bit more of a moist environment so that they can actually function better. And that has helped some of my patients. Some patients will get a whole house humidifier. I've seen some interesting bids on that when I've asked that question to patients. So I'm not sure what's going on with that industry. It used to be a lot less expensive than it currently is. Um, um, thank you. Oh, now, there are other kinds of Parkinson's. A person put in, a question about, I have progressive supranuclear palsy, what can I expect in my eyes? I'd actually like to talk to you directly because that's a more rare uh, variant and there are some very specific problems related to that problem that none of anybody else listening to has got to worry about. And, and then there's another one about, I have cortical basal degeneration and what can I expect in my eyes? Typically when you have cortical basal degeneration and your eye movement effects are already involved, that's actually probably going to slowly progressively get a little bit worse. I wouldn't be surprised if this individual is reading with one eye, if they already have separate glasses for distance and near. They definitely would need help with regards to getting around, um, might be wheelchair bound. So those are all uh, important things to make sure that the patient stays safe. All of the near point activities like iPads, um, the computers that you can look at so that you can have all of your accomplished tasks happening up close is important for that patient so that you can see what you need to and have it in a comforting, a comfortable zone for you to uh, accomplish tasks that you need to. Oh, and then Lewy body dementia, how does it affect glaucoma? Uh, Lewy body dementia is a, a more uh, progressive form of dementia. There can be patients with Parkinson's who also have Lewy body dementia. I don't particularly like that dementia at all. I find it particularly mean uh, in I, I have several patients over the years that have had that disease process, and uh, to be real honest, I've not enjoyed the journey. I'm almost sure they haven't um, with regards to that disease process. Glaucoma is not really associated with Lewy body uh, dementia, similar to other Parkinson's. We treat the diseases completely separate. We do need to be careful, though, because when you're dealing with dementia, then you're worried about whether or not the patients are getting their drops, can they remember to take their drops, all those other things that we have to pay attention to. So it wouldn't surprise me, if, depending on how severe the Lewy body dementia is, as to whether or not that patient's moving toward having surgical procedures done and under topical or local anesthetic so that we don't have to apply any general anesthesia, is that's not a good thing in the presence of dementia as well. So we have to treat those patients with a, a whole lot more care. We need to be circumspect about what we're doing long-term. 
so that we can maintain good vision and function. It wouldn't surprise me if someone had mild glaucoma and Lewy body dementia and, did, and had a very difficult time doing eye drops. If their glaucoma is so slowly progressive, we know Lewy body dementia is not. We would choose to possibly not even treat the glaucoma knowing that they're not going to lose their vision before God takes them home. And that might make sometimes, that's where you have to have good, clear communications occurring between the doctor and the patient so that we make good choices uh, based on how the patient is going through their day. Thank you. All right, we have question, just a minute. Is burning, can we turn your audio off? Is burning eyes part of dry eye or something else? Just. The question, the question is, is, is burning, burning uh, a uh, symptom of dry eye? It actually can be. In some patients, their tolerance of uh, their eyes burning is uh, better than others. Some patients, it just drives them crazy. So we, and sometimes, believe it or not, in my world, the symptoms um, are much more severe than the signs that we see. So we listen to the patient to kind of figure out how much are they bothered by it. And we will often, uh, prescribe treatment based on the patient's symptoms because that's the only thing we can get back as a feedback from them when we see them a, a week later or six weeks later as to how are they actually feeling? Is it still burning as much? Typically, we try and get the patients so that they're much more comfortable. Some patients will take their artificial teardrops and they'll actually stick them in the refrigerator because they find that cool drops feel better. So that's a trick that you might want to try to help if the burning's there. Sometimes burning, though, is associated with a uh, uh, additional problems, kind of like allergic conjunctivitis. Usually that's itching, but I've had patients teach me that it can be burning. Well, we will sometimes prescribe an allergy drop, as weird as it sounds, to treat the dry eye problem, and it works, teaching us that there is definitely some uh, inflammatory cascades that respond better to the topical allergy drops. The nice thing about the topical allergy drops is they can be started and stopped based on the patient's symptoms, and then the patients don't have to worry about long-term use of them. Whereas when we use topical steroids, there's lots of long-term risk with those. And so we choose to try and keep patients on the least complicating medic medication regimen as we can, provided they can take them. Let's see, we have one here. I have difficulty watching TV, especially in the evening. Movies with subtitles seem even more challenging. Are drops my best option, or is this a place for prism glasses? Just a second. Excellent question. Just, question. just a second. Question. <laughs> She's muted. That's too funny. <laughs> I think we got this fixed. Good. Um, the question was, is that when I'm watching TV, is this, and, and I, I can't keep my eyes open and I can't seem to get things in focus. Is this a place for artificial teardrops? Is this a, a part for prism glasses? Well, my questions would be, when you look at the TV, do you have one TV or do you have two TVs? And there are TVs up and down from one another or side by side? <laughs> if they're side by side or up and down, it would indicate that you have double vision. That would then make me suspicious that prism glasses may actually help you. If you have an image and a ghost, and most of my patients know what that is, that's where there's definitely an image, they know what the real image is, but there's a shadow in the image right next to it. That would indicate that you actually have a need for glasses to help crisp the image up. So whether or not that can be done with glasses, whether or not you're actually having the early signs of a cataract, because cataracts can cause a ghost image, you would then have to have your eye care provider help you define as far as what the best way, what's the best thing to do there. When it comes to TV, if the TV's at distance and you're noticing double, but you notice that your computer doesn't have any double vision, well then I would move the format on how you watch TV to the computer format, because that's now readily doable in most homes. You could try that, because then at near point, if you're not having any problems with double vision, you could be able to then also read the subtitles better. It's very difficult to read the subtitles of movies unless the vision is crisp. And your vision's got to be about 20, 30 to 20, 25. 
at least in one eye to accomplish reading subtitles and then keep in mind when you have Parkinson's if you can't track real well which is not unusual you're gonna have a very difficult time uh, doing the subtitles you'll also have a very good time difficult time with any scrolling of words that are coming on the bottom as well because you can't get them in focus fast as uh, as fast as they're moving and it creates a fair amount of frustration just like dealing with the stock ticker tape that I've seen on some state business stations you can't get it in focus fast enough to be able to make any sense as to what it's saying uh, I would I would tell you that uh, don't watch movies in subtitles if that's an issue move it over to computer screen because it might be slower and larger magnification to make it easier for you would be how I would try and solve that for okay um, next one I have dystonia in my neck and my head is almost always tilted to the left this makes it a challenge to use progressive lenses you want to turn your thing on because my head is not parallel to the world. Any suggestions? Should I get two pairs of glasses, one for everything and another for just reading? Excellent question. So dystonia means so the lady, the person who's asked the question says, my head is canted to the left. And then the problem is, is that when they go to read, they're quite astute. They've realized that the progressive lens gets in the way. The reason that happens is that the eyes are now fixated probably down and a little bit to the left as well, and they can't move their head straight up, so they can't look straight down. That makes an optical aid like glasses tough. The way to solve that, believe it or not, is just straight reading glasses. And the reason that works is the reading glasses themselves have a much wider field to look through. So even if you have a little bit of dystonia and your head is tilted, you can actually still fix fixate well enough to be able to read. You might find though that you still need to use like a ruler or something so you don't keep losing your place because uh, that can happen when you can't hold your neck in the right spot. There's patients who suffer from a lot of uh, spinal issues and they end up having their head fixed up or fixed down. They actually are all in a single vision glasses for tasks. So if they at the computer all day, that's a separate distance than reading. Then they have computer glasses, they have reading glasses, and then they have distance glasses. So we divide all that up based on where you're going to function the best. And because of the dystonia, I definitely not have a progressive simply because it's not unusual with dystonia to also have balance issues and we would not want you falling. And we know that it's entirely possible. So moving to single vision uh, lenses is important. And that don't get them at the same frame though. I have one gentleman, all his glasses look the same. So he's got to go through all three to figure out which ones are for TV, which ones are for computer, and which ones are for distance. So we had discussion about making making one of them pink. He didn't like that very much, but we would be able to tell the difference. So. Okay, is there a good remedy to prolong night driving uh, due to glare issues? Glare at night. It's become a bigger deal here recently. I'm not sure if it's because the overall population is aging. I also think their contributing factor is the oncoming car headlights of the LED, xenon, and uh, halogen headlights are annoying for a lot of us. They're, here in Central Oregon, we have a lot of roads that don't have a fog line. The fog line is the white line that's on the right, on the um, passenger side of the road. There's roads here that don't have it. So when oncoming cars are coming, you don't know where to look because there's no fog line to watch. One of the tricks I've had patients try, and I've had a little bit of success with that, is the patients can pick up what are called trap shooting glasses. So those are glasses that trap shooters use. And they're yellow or orange. They're called overfits. They fit over your current glasses. It can help. It, it mitigates against the halogen, xenon, and LED headlights so that the patient's not as bothered by it. It really can help for nighttime driving so that you're not as bothered by glare. But understand that dry eye contributes to glare, cataract contributes to glare. These things are all real and can be a problem for the uh, patient. So I have found that the orange yellow trap shooting glasses that come as overfits can help 
mitigate this problem to where they can be out driving at night uh, more than they currently are, which is a benefit to that patient because we want to encourage mobility and being out in public. Thank you. All right. All right. I am being treated for depression. Would those meds that you've discussed aggravate dry eye and would frequent crying spells also aggravate it? Excellent question. So the patient has asked that they're on um, antidepressant medication, they're on medications to treat depression and they wondering if that can actually make their dry eye worse. The answer is yes. The side effect of all those medications can be dry eye. We don't recommend that patients suddenly stop those medications to go treat their dry eye. We think that actually really has to be under the care of you and your physician so that you make good choices. Crying bouts are a little bit different. Crying comes from your lacrimal gland. That's the guy that's up underneath your brow here. Your normal basal secretion comes from where your eyelids attach to your eyeball. When you go cry, that tear is not quite the same as the secreted tears you make throughout your day to help you see. So you can end up, after you're having a crying spell, thinking that you're not seeing very well, like you're seen underwater. It's a true statement because if you're having crying fits, the goblet cell layer, the mucin cell layer, is being thinned out a little bit much and you can actually end up having not the best vision because you've messed up with how your tear layers are working together because of the crying. So it makes sense then that you would be bothered by that. If you're, uh, the, having, you know, outside of addressing the fact that your crying fits are not uncommon, except they usually aren't an everyday, all day phenomenon, eventually whatever emotional distress the patient is experiencing gets less and the crying fits become less and the tear film can get back to its normal respirative state. Some people will think that if they cry a lot, they shouldn't have dry eye. That's not necessarily true because the, the tear composition is different than your baseline tear comp than your baseline tears that you make. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Stevens, I think we're about done with our questions. Do you have a little uh, closing remark of some kind that you'd like to make for us? All right. So as I have here on the slide, if you have any other questions, please feel free to email them to me at carol at parkinsonsresources.org. And if you would like any more information about our services at Parkinson's Resources of Oregon, our website is parkinsonsresources.org, and I've included the 800 number as well. We really appreciate you being with us today and we look forward to meeting you personally or uh, the next time we have a webinar. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Bye-bye.